this over. Nope, nope, that's not it. God dang it. Thomas, where's the play button? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the live All right, guys, welcome back to the live period. Uh, today, we have our friend Jeff Perlman, nine-time, right? Nine-time New York Times bestselling author. Is that accurate? It's a little misleading. It's a, uh, I've on, you could have books. just said yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I don't like it. I like being honest. It's a, uh, I've been on the list six times. I've written okay. nine books. Okay. So what it is, if the publisher will phrase it as, he is the New York Times bestselling author of nine books. Oh, uh, that's fancy. It's like saying I'm the Academy Award winning actor of 12 movies. Right. But two of those movies could be like um, the Cable Guy and, you know, whatever. Good Burger. It's, it's Nicolas Cage, Academy Award winning actor of 312 movies. 100%. Right. Yeah. That's basically me without the 312 movies. <laughs> Well, that's great. Uh, it uh, So uh, Jeff just wrote a book called Three Ring Circus that we're going to talk about today and a book that I've been reading. You guys have seen me tweet about it a little bit. We had Mark Madsen on the other day uh, with a shout out to Jeff on the, uh, the book that uh, uh, Jeff knew the ins and outs of this team uh, better than Mark Madsen, who was on the team. So, <laughs> so that's pretty good. That's, uh, that's a good start. Um, so we appreciate you coming on, uh, just kind of want to talk a little bit about the book, a little bit about the process, uh, probably before we dive into the book, because, you know, looking at your resume and your repertoire of what you've written all over the place in sports with lots of really interesting characters, lots of, of, uh, um, flawed characters, lots of, of just super interesting people that, that, you know, we've all seen and know and really diving into who these people are and what was going on when we were all watching them on TV and, you know, what was really going on in the background there. So um, I guess, first off, like when you're, when you're getting ready to, to write a book like this, and of course you've, you've done quite a few of these by this point, but as a writer, you have all these stories to choose from in sports. Uh, it, how, how do you, how do you, how did you land on this one? I know you did Showtime before uh, with the eighties, but what, what spoke to you and said, you know what, I really want to kind of dive into this, this, this era in the in Lakers history. Um, so I'm not really about, I've never, I, I don't think I've ever written a book where I thought, Oh, I really want to write about this team because of the team. Like, it's not like I was like, Oh, the Lakers, I got to write about the Lakers. Just like, I was never like, Oh, I got to write about the Cowboys or like, I'm really a fan of good characters and good storylines. And I just think if you look at that team in that time period, um, obviously Shaq and Kobe are two huge iconic characters in professional basketball. I think Phil Jackson probably goes down as an iconic character in basketball, certainly coaching. Um, and I just thought, you know, I wrote a book, as you mentioned, called Showtime. And it ended, it was the, it was the Magic Johnson era. And it ended with Magic's HIV diagnosis in 91. Mm -hmm. And it was a very abrupt ending on purpose, because that's how it ended in real life. It was very abrupt. And I just thought this book in a way felt a little bit like a sequel. Um, and it actually starts, uh, you said you've read a lot of it, starts with Magic Johnson's return to Lakers in 95. Yep. The awkwardness of that return and how yeah. it's almost like here was a guy from a different generation who didn't quite fit in anymore. And I just thought it almost felt like a sequel. So I was really, it, it was a very comfortable topic for me writing about the Lakers. So when you... You, you get to that point and you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to write about this next story. Like if, if, if I was, if I was to pick up a book and or a topic and start writing a book, I don't even know where I would begin. Like I, you, we're talking about some really intimate details of you know, road trips and what was going on in guys' personal lives. And, and, you know, some of these the, the, the juggernauts, uh, cause when did you start writing this? When, when did you begin? About like doing your research and everything. What was it? Two and a half years ago. Okay. So two and a half years ago, you're, you're starting, like, who do you pick up the phone and call? Like, how do you even begin starting to dive into these yeah, almost inaccessible guys in a, in a lot of ways? Um, I mean, the first thing I always do is I, I go on eBay and I buy every media guide available. So I, I literally go on eBay and order one after another, after another, after another. And then I basically make files of every single person in every media guide. And I, um, and I will, you know, um, 
just try finding them. And it's not just the players, it's the coaches, it's the assistant coaches, it's the ball boys, it's the Laker girls, it's the administrative, op, you know, employees, on and on and on. At the same time I'm doing that, I mean, I'm working on a book now about Bo Jackson, just as an example of my next yes. project. Beautiful. Yes. This is literally today, going through newspapers.com day by day wow. and building this library. This is like- just, this I saw you highlighting thing. stuff on Twitter saying, yeah. you know, finding this. I mean, that's what you do. So you go through, so at the same time you're doing that, you build this library of just stuff, you know, in this case, Bo Jackson, in that case, Lakers, and you'll read through it and you'll see, maybe you'll see, all right, Shaquille O'Neal, in 1996, he was um, looking for a house in Manhattan Beach. And maybe you'll find the name of the real estate agent who was showing him around. You'll circle that name and you'll add it to the list of people you want to call. And then you just start calling and calling and calling and calling. And you start generally, at least I do, with the sort of... Uh, fringe characters so to speak uh mm. people who are cut in training camp people who are on the summer league team again real estate agents and girlfriends or you know boyfriends or whatever that whole sort of fringe and right. you come in and in and in and what you could start to be able to say to people then when you call like samaki walker or rick fox you can say my name is jeff perelman I'm doing this book i've written these other books um i've already interviewed this person this 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 and this and then you get them and then when you go to a shack or Phil Jackson, you say, you know, I'm working on this book. I talked to all these people. I talked to Samaki Walker. I talked to Rick Fox. It's like you build up this thing <laughs> and then you approach the people. Um, so you've got this pyramid going that starts a with, little bit. Like I texted bit. Shea Seals when it got to his part. I was like, hey, I just read about you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shea Seals. I mean, I love finding it. Like, I love that Shea Seals is in this book because yeah. I remember Shea Seals at Tulsa and I remember thinking his name was really cool. And I remember him with, same with like Mike Penberthy. I love that Mike Penberthy is in this book, guy out of master's college. Like I love finding those, not fringe is unfair, but the guys you don't think of. Right. They're right. not the mainstream guys and finding their stories. Because I always say like, um, my guiding principle is this, my true guiding principle is this. Um, like I wrote Brett Favre's biography. In 1999, there was some free agent running back in camp with the Packers for two weeks from like Bucknell or Delaware State or Bethune Cookman. And that guy was there for two weeks and they got cut. And Brett Favre will not remember that guy the moment he's gone from camp. But that guy will always remember his two weeks with Brett Favre. Right. And he'll have these vivid stories to tell, you know? And and those stories are important. So I, I'm a big believer in just calling as many people as possible and getting their memories. Well, and I think, I think that was probably uh, like when we talked to Mark and, you know, he's you know, he played a lot of games in those seasons that he was there and he's, he's a big part of that, but you spoke to people that, like you said, were on the fringes that knew details of things that happened that even Mark was like, geez, I didn't even know that was going on. You know, right. I'm off over here doing this thing. And, and I thought that was what he said. I said to someone today, that's probably the best compliment you can get as a guy writing books. Like it's not, you don't really want the people you're writing about to say, that was the best book ever. And you don't want to say that was the worst book ever because you don't want him. It can't be to be crude. It can't be a hand job to him. And right. it also can't be a takedown of him. Like you don't want it. You're, you're there to tell a story and it's supposed to be unvarnished. It's supposed to be truthful. It's supposed to be fair. It's supposed to be accurate. So when someone comes along like Mark Madison, who is there and says, man, he really nailed that story. He told me things I didn't even know. That's a great, to me, that's the best compliment you can get. That's awesome. As soon as, as soon as you said it, I was like, ah, Jeff's going to love that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, cause, and, and Mark is just like such a personable guy that was, you know, he wasn't an outcast. He wasn't a guy that just totally kept to himself, whatever. He's just like big Mark and, you know, he's around and, and he's, you know, seeing and hearing all these things. And, and so he, uh, uh, I, I'm excited to kind of get to the part now knowing him uh, apart from the Lakers, I, I didn't know Mark until he actually got the job at Utah Valley. Yeah, I've been friends since then, and uh, so I, I'm excited to get to the part of the book here where where he's going to be more in there and and talking about those last two years that he was with him for the second and third. He's a nice guy, like a legitimately nice human being, which yes. is really this is cool. He's a yeah. nice guy. Yeah, he's Jeff. The best. If I could say something, I I really appreciate how you are in this book, finding so many people like a real estate agent and, and the, the role players and guys that didn't quite make it um, because their stories are so genuine. Mm -hmm. And I, I know for me, like a story that I, I tell sometimes to people, Jerry Stackhouse, when I was in college, I went to a workout in Atlanta and I roll up and there's an orange Benz 
an orange Benz sitting outside. I'm like, what? Why is there an orange Benz here? I walk in and Stackhouse is working out with us. That's and awesome. the dude's wear- and the dude's wearing his own jersey. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, I thought of it like, okay, this is cool, weird, whatever. But like now, you look back and it's like you tell people that, and they're like, wait, what, dude? That's unbelievable. But like right. for him, he'd be like, yeah, dude, I do that like every day. Doesn't right. Matter. And so you like, have that memory. And you have you that have memory. Really vi- yeah, and that's a great. That's a perfect example. Like Stackhouse. If I said to him, you remember that time you worked out with these guys? He'd be like, I don't know. I had a million workouts. But you're always going to remember Stackhouse showing yeah. up in his own jersey. Well, it gives, it gives your story, you know, as, as I'm reading through this thing and just it, it's it's not even like a main focal point of, of a chapter, or even a paragraph, but just sentences here and there that give it this this color that bring that story to life, just game situations and stuff. Yeah. And uh, and that's and that's what I've you know, I've, I've loved about this book. And, you know, I when I read something um, at my I got two little kids. um going a million miles an hour creatively with different things and all this sort of stuff. And so like, if I get a book, like I'm, it's not very often anymore. It's not as often as it should be, but like, you know, I'm just hoping like, Oh my gosh, I hope this book is, is what I think it's going to be. And, and this one, I'm just plowing through it as fast as I can and have, have loved it because of those snippet stories. Like, like we all know the main parts of Shaq and Kobe and Phil mm-hmm. and the stuff that was in the media, but it's, it's those bits that give it life. So I appreciate um, that. So as you're, as you're talking to all these guys, you're kind of working your way up this pyramid, right? You're piece by piece to this thing. I, I guess, what were some things that maybe stuck out to you that, you know, you, again, you know the stories, you've, you've read the media guides, but something that, that maybe just jumped out as you, that, that was surprising, I guess, that, that you just kind of weren't really prepared for? Well, the thing I love the most, like my, I think my favorite, I don't know, it's a story I tell a lot, but I really enjoyed was, um, how basically John Calipari is the reason that Kobe Bryant became a Laker. <laughs> yeah. And going into that 96 draft, the Nick Calipari is a new coach of the New Jersey Nets. They have the number eight pick overall. They've worked out Kobe. They love Kobe Bryant. John Nash is a general manager. They're all in on Kobe. They call Kobe's parents, Joe and Pam. And they're like, how would you feel if we selected your son? Oh, that'd be great. He's right down and near outside of Philly. So it's a quick drive. Perfect, perfect, perfect. But Kobe already has a shoe deal with Adidas. And Adidas doesn't want Kobe Bryant playing in East Rutherford, New Jersey, you know, for the crappy Nets. And um, so uh, Arn Tellum, Kobe's agent, and Jerry West have been very close friends. And West worked out Kobe twice and said he was the bad, most impressive player he'd ever worked out in his life. And Jerry West works out this deal with Charlotte with Kobe Foss to the 13th selection. They'll trade him Vladi Divac for the 13th. They take Kobe and they'll take, you know, they'll get that pick. But they have to make sure the Nets don't draft Kobe because 9 through 12, there's no interest in Kobe. It's either going to be the Nets or it's going to go to Charlotte. So um, Kobe, the day before the draft, calls John Calipari and says, you know, coach, I've been thinking about it. I don't want to be near my parents. It's too close to my parents. I don't want to, I don't want you guys to draft. Calipari's freaking out. Oh, my God. What the hell? This is, oh, my God. And John Nash, the GM, is like, how? It's just bluffing. Don't worry about it. Then Arn tell him, the coach, the uh, Agent for Kobe calls Cal and says, listen, Cal, he doesn't want to play for you guys. He'll probably sit out the year and play in Italy if you draft him. Calipari goes back to Nash. Oh, my God, what the hell? John Nash is like, calm down. It's okay. Kerry Kittles, Villanova All-American, excellent player. Yep. Um, he uh, He's represented by David Falk, Michael Jordan's agent. And David Falk, Kittles desperately wants to play for the Nets. David Falk calls Calipari. This is unrelated to anything that just happened. Just calls Calipari and says, listen, Kerry wants to play for you guys. If you don't take him at number eight, I cannot guarantee I will send free agents to you in the future. Oh my God, what the <laughs> hell? This is the worst. Oh my God. Goes into John Nash. John, we can't take... John Nash is like, Cal, calm down. It's all bluff. It's a high school kid. He's not, not going to play for us. Calm down. Goes home that night. John Nash knows they're going to draft Kobe. It's draft day. We're drafting Kobe. Calipari holds a team meeting over, I think, breakfast or lunch. And everyone's there, and he says, listen, guys. I, oh, and Calipari, importantly, in his contract, had a final personnel say over the GM. And he says, uh, I've been thinking about it. Here's what we're going to do. Kerry Kittles is there at number eight. We're taking Kerry Kittles. If he's not there, we're taking Kobe Bryant. John Nash is just, oh, devastated. Number eight pick comes. Kerry Kittles is sitting there. They draft Kerry Kittles. And uh, when the Lakers when the Lakers make the deal and get Kobe, Jerry West goes into Jerry Buss, the owner of the Lakers' office, and says, I just got you the best player in this draft. 
And I interviewed Kerry Kittles for the book. And Kittles was a great player at Villanova. And he had played against Kobe in some summer games. And he said to me, he said, um, if I were the Nets, I would have drafted Kobe Bryant too. Kobe <laughs> so, That's great stuff. Yeah, I, I love that. When, when I was reading that, I went back and actually read the part again to make sure that I understood. Like, did I just read that Calipari said, nah, dog, like we're, we're taking Kerry Kittles. Taking Kittles. Kobe Bryant. Kittles was a great player. I mean, Kittles was a great sure. college player and a very good NBA player. It was not like they drafted Michael Allo or Condi. You know, like he was right. a very good NBA player, but he wasn't Kobe. He Bryant. wasn't Kobe Bryant, right? You know, it, it the the <laughs> I'm I'm reading and and it's re- relatively early on in the book when uh, you're talking about Kobe's rookie year and um, losing in the playoffs to the Jazz and the way that you wrote that gave me a goddamn panic attack. Because I knew what happened, but reading the uh, the it goes up and up and up yeah. and air balls. I didn't I didn't remember how it all went down. I knew they had lost, but I didn't I didn't really know the story of of Kobe. What four air balls? Jacked four, four air balls towards four. the end of the game or something. The funny thing is, I liked how the um, I interviewed a guy named Stephen Howard who was on Utah's bench. And I was like, what were you, what were you during that moment? Where were you mentally? And he's like, I just wanted Kobe to keep shooting. And every time he shot the ball, I was like, this is great. You know, like one of the few times in his career, shooting. anybody said that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but I don't want Eddie Jones shooting. I don't want Nick Van Exel shooting. Let the rookie right. 18 year old do it. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading. I'm, I'm like, literally, get, I'm like, I know what happened. It's like watching Titanic thinking the boat's not going to sink or something. Yeah. The, the way, the way that you wrote that uh, was great. It was great. And uh it is it is super interesting to really kind of you know get get a a broader perspective i think of what kobe really was as a player coming out like just how young he was just how raw and inexperienced he was and uh as a player how flawed he was at the beginning which then that's when you really start to see the building of greatness but if you're not looking for it you don't see it you know, that somebody that somebody throws up four air balls and the next morning is in the gym mm-hmm. putting up shots. And and I imagine at the time they're all thinking that they've, you know, made made a mistake. But the, and I don't remember who it was. You wrote about them still thinking like, shit, this is this is going to be one of the greatest of all time. It was after, Shaq, actually. Yeah. The, after he misses Shaq four air balls, Shaq's going, you know, this guy's amazing. Well, you know, what? because Shaq, so Shaq had played in Orlando with Nick Anderson. And if you remember, Nick Anderson missed the clutch free throws and Shaq kind of always questioned that guy's heart. And there's something about, you know, like that moment really could have ruined Kobe Bryant. There are players who that would have ruined. There are certainly players who would not have taken those shots, especially after one air ball, especially after two air balls where you're just, you get the ball and you're getting it over to Van Exel. All these guys were wide open and you're still shooting the ball. And so you can say on the one hand, why, why do you keep shooting? But on the other hand, he wants to shoot like he's all in and that said something about him and and um i don't know the guy was just born with something or created with something very unique which is it's almost like robert ori someone asked ori who was a, obviously a great clutch shooter um why are you why are you not afraid why are you why are you unafraid to take the big shot and his response was because if i make it i make it and if i miss i miss and it's as simple as that you know it's just like if i miss a shot i miss a shot and like life goes on and in a way, Kobe was the same way. He was unafraid to take it because he could deal with the consequences of missing a shot. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he, you talk about his, you know, some of the meetings and stuff, you know, that people might think that maybe Kobe over time developed this razor edge with people and other players or, or, you know, put up this wall and stuff. But from the drop, you know, he's going into those meetings in the, before the season starts, basically telling everybody like, I'm nobody's bitch. This is my team. Yeah. Shaq's looking over there like, huh? <laughs> you know, yeah. everybody, everybody's looking around like, who's this young punk kid? And it's like, I mean, this guy knew from the beginning that this is who he was going to eventually become. As it's an unusual way to be because um, it doesn't work out very often. I don't know. <laughs> and in some ways, I mean, in a way it's, it makes you, it made him a great basketball player and it made him a great Laker and it brought him but you know like i just always say i think working on this book and promoting the book i really started to think about this more and more like kobe would get all this praise because um come off season he's shooting 500 jumpers a day and he's doing wind sprints and he's doing stadium steps 
And Shaq, meanwhile, was back home in Orlando floating in his pool, smoking a cigar and drinking a brandy. And people are saying, oh, Shaq, he, you know, he, he doesn't take it seriously enough. He doesn't take it seriously enough. And what I've really come to learn, and I think this comes with being older, I'm 48, is you, you only get to enjoy this stuff once. Like you're Shaq, you're 27 years old. Right. You're making filthy money to play a game in glorified pajamas, throwing a ball through a hoop, right? You live in a mansion. You have this off season. You only get to enjoy that once in your life. There's only one go around where you get to be that. And I think in some ways there's something sad about, like I've interviewed many athletes and their, their thing is, well, I'll enjoy it when I'm retired. That's right. the thing. I'll enjoy it when I'm retired. I got to work for them. I'm like, I hate to be this way, but it's true. Like Kobe Bryant is dead at 41 years old. Like he's not going to be able to enjoy the memories of it. And I do think you do have to enjoy it while it happens. Yeah. yeah, maybe Shaq could have been a greater player. Maybe Shaq could have been the greatest player, blah, 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 whoever lived. Still one of the 20 greatest NBA players of all time. And I think he generally enjoyed the ride. Right. And I just think I would never, I'd never at any other point in my life say uh, he should have worked harder, blah, blah, blah. Because I think there's something to be said for enjoying it while you have it. And he did. Well, it's, it's interesting because <clears throat> knowing what we know now, the, the Kobe story plays out like this Greek tragedy because of what you just said, where he's giving and giving and giving everything he's got to this, this game or to the fans or to the team, whoever you feel like he's giving it to. Mm -hmm. um, even if you, even if he feels like it's for him, because that's just the way his psyche is, it's, it's become this tragedy that, you know, well, like we talked about with Mark, like we didn't get to enjoy post-career Kobe, you know, Kobe's on the plane with Mark saying, Hey, I'm going to tell stories. I'm going to, I'm going to do all these creative things. He was doing these amazing things leading right up until when he died, as far as, you know, just the, the stories he wanted to tell. And, and we didn't get to enjoy it either. Yeah. I don't, I know what you're saying. I don't know. To me, like the tragedy, honestly, is just like, I just like this guy was 41 years old and he died in a helicopter crash with his daughter and there are yeah. three kids right now who are raising being raised without a dad i mean that's and yeah like, obviously that's the act i'm just saying like strategy, yeah. it like i don't know if he were to create a good stuff or crap but i do know that like he died with his daughter and there are three girls who won't be raised by a father and to me i'm not saying you're wrong i'm not trying to i'm just saying like i can't get past that like i yeah, really right. i'm struggling to get past the fact that there was a last moment where he was on a helicopter with his daughter and these other people and they all probably knew they were about to die yeah. and they don't exist anymore. And I mean, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it when it happened, not because of some, you know, connection to Kobe. Cause I had none, uh, but I've got two daughters and you know, that's, that's the thing that anytime somebody talks about it or whatever, I have difficulty wrapping my head around with thinking through that. Yep. So, so for me, as I was reading it, it was more about as a, as a player and as a creator uh, of, of, things you know which at the end of the day is frivolous stuff but uh um i don't know if, it's... if i if i could jump in I, I not to get away from the kobe stuff but uh you were talking about Shaq, the short the shortcomings with Shaq and when compared to kobe you, you hear all the time like hey he could have made more free throws he could have been a better free throw shooter mm -hmm. but jeff it, being a former player it's, it's like you said, the dude's making 30, 40, 50, 60 million a year. Like, because the average Joe is sitting on his couch and is like, my shortcomings in life, Shaq, you should be better, you know? And it's like, wait, dude, uh, what is he supposed to do? Like, go in the gym three more hours a day so you can not yell at him? Like, it's, it's just, it's one of those things that I think most Americans, most people in the world just don't get is how hard these guys do work and they have to let off some steam. And Kobe Bryant's, Jordan's, there, there's not many of them. I didn't play with a lot of guys like Kobe or Jordan that had that drive. Right. And and I think it's just when it comes to Shaq, I, I respect the crap out of his game. You know, he didn't make free throws well. He didn't shoot them well. But no. his hand, his hands were the size of a freaking uh, twenty inch pizza. <laughs> well, it's also kind of funny. I agree with saying you just said like we um we go about our jobs, whatever it is, at the law firm or at the dental office or collecting garbage or whatever it is, and we go and for the most part, people go. They do their nine hours or whatever it is, and they go home. And nobody's like, listen, man, on the trash truck today, you did not, 
I just thought your form on picking up those garbage cans was off or like at the dental office, man, that molar, I don't know. Like, like there's something and I get it. They make a lot of money. So it's, it's certainly, you can make that argument that they get paid a lot of money and blah, blah, blah. But I do think it's funny how we are. And a lot of it is because it is, it's entertainment. At the end of the day, it's entertainment, it's public entertainment. It takes us away from our own shitty lives, you know, that we can yell at the TV and yell at Shaq or whoever. But I do agree with you. It's like, Shaq worked really hard. He was, was he a good free throw shooter? No. Could he have worked harder on it? Probably so. But the guy was getting his ass kicked every night. He was being doubled. People don't remember this. This is the thing. If he, he played San ball. Antonio, he, if they were playing the Spurs, it wasn't, he wasn't being guarded by Tim Duncan. He was being guarded by Tim Duncan and Malik Rivers. You know, like, and they were beating the shit out of him. Every yeah. night it was double team, double team, double team, where he was getting physically pummeled. And it wasn't that easy for a guy. It's not that easy for a guy that size to just get up the next day and be like, all right, I'm going to do wind sprints. I can't wait to do wind sprints. He's seven feet, 300 pounds. Like it's not, it takes a lot <laughs> to get that size of a human moving. So I just yeah. think people gave that guy way too much grief for an amazing, amazing career. And and it's even bonkers to think of him towards the end of his career that that dude was still going. I can't yeah. like, like moving, moving that size is I mean, that's, that's one of the most athletic things that we've ever seen. But if you said, Hey, give me, give me some of the top athletes of all time. Nobody's going to list Shaq as an athlete, like in that elite athleticism yeah. category. But in reality, like, well, cause you wouldn't think of him. You wouldn't be like Usain Bolt and Shaq. Right. No, <laughs> right. Yeah. But Hey, 300 plus whatever the heck he was pounds. And at the end that number kept going up and the fact that he could get it up and down that court and it hell win a championship, you know, okay is uh is unbelievable what, what what's something that that uh like th this is kind of one of those things it's just like when i do these podcasts like i love getting our guests on here i love having this sit down conversation with you what was something that you just took away and just loved the time that you spent on on some piece of this or somebody that you talked to well i mean the um the one that's carried me through the most like conversation as far as stories that i'll be telling for years is the Lakers in uh, 2000, 2001, one of their players was J.R. Ryder. Mm -hmm. And um, so J.R. Ryder, I didn't have a phone number. I just had an address for him. And J.R. Ryder, he lives in Arizona. I live in California. I was going to be in Arizona. So I figured I would just show up at his house and knock on his door, and um, which I've done before. And um, not his house. I've done other people's houses. And uh, J.R. <laughs> Ryder, he definitely has a mixed bag reputation as far as he's a little out there, you know, and like, you never knew. And he, he was from not pretty tough background and, you know, threatened a few reporters through the years and blah, blah. But I, uh, I drove out to his house and I had this address and I knock on his door and this kid answers. And I'm like, Hey, is J.R. Ryder here? I'm a writer. You know, I'm a reporter. And he closes the door and a woman comes and I'm like, Hey, I'm looking for J.R. Ryder. I'm working on a book about the Lakers. Blah, blah, blah. She closes the door. I hear these two people yelling in the background. It's this woman and a guy. And I'm thinking, uh, I don't know. And uh, door opens and there's J.R. Ryder. And he goes, who are you? And I'm like, hey, my name is Jeff Perlman. I'm, I had a book with me, a USFL book. I wrote, like, I'm an author and I'm working on a book about the Lakers. He goes, uh, bro, bro, no, 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 no. Bro, you don't just show up. You just show up. Are you fucking kidding me? You just show up my fucking door, bro. Are you fucking kidding me? He opens the door. He comes out. Jerry Ryder's a big guy. It's like, bro, that is fucking not cool, man. Not cool. You just fucking, what's that book you got? <laughs> I go, uh, it's a book I wrote about the USFL. Is that the league Trump was in? I'm like, yeah. You wrote that? Yeah. What are you working on? It's a book about the Lakers, Shaq Kobier. Yeah, I got good stories. All right, man, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. <laughs> and awesome. he ended up giving me his phone number. He couldn't talk at the time, but he gave me two hours of awesome. And wow. uh, it always pays to try and knock on a door unless someone punches you in the face. Then it's <laughs> <laughs> I love that moment. Like, I love that moment. And I love that he was great. And I enjoyed every second of talking to him. And I love having those stories. You know, I used to have a college roommate named Paul Dewar. And one night we were going out. I swear to God, this is true. University of Delaware, senior year. We're going out to the bars and hopefully hook up or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, um, he's like, you know, whatever happens, he goes, it's all about the stories. He goes, it's all about the stories. 
And I've always used that as like my guiding principle. Like it's at the end of the day, yeah. it wasn't really about hooking up. It wasn't about getting drunk. It was just about a story you can tell 25 years later. For sure. I feel like those stories, nope. J.R. Ryder, like that's, that's what it's all about is having really good stories to tell. 100%. I mean, I, I, think, I think anybody in, you know, t- well, Thomas as a player, you know, Thomas, Thomas doesn't ever tell me about the games that he scored, whatever in, because he's got some of those great stories too. He tells yeah. me about the stories in Italy and France and going out and having a good time and whatever. Like, you know, I, I go to Africa and I run camps in third world countries and for bas- basketball stuff. And, and like, I'm usually not talking about the basketball camp. It's right. the, Hey, Bahati took us out to this bar and, and it's in the middle of this dark neighborhood there's no lights on anywhere i know there's power in this neighborhood there's no lights on anywhere it's because all the power is going to one bar and there's literally Maasai warriors parking cars and it's the craziest shit i've ever seen and like that story just sticks in your head and and you can hear those stories in this because i know whoever's telling you you know whoever you're interviewing there whoever's responding to you like they're telling you this story and that's it's so vivid i mean that's the thing that has stuck with them you know is they're they're telling you these things Right. Um, Jeff, could I uh, ask if there was any preconceived notions? I mean, obviously, J.R. Ryder story is awesome, but anything going into the book and, and writing and, and, and finding out all these people, was there anything that really just shook you with who you thought might be this or, or you had a different thought? Um, you know, to me, Kobe was really a mystery. Like, I just didn't know. Um, I just didn't know. I, f- I feel like there's been a lot of interesting things written about him. He's been interviewed, obviously was interviewed a ton, but he was kind of a mystery, you know, in a way, like he was kind of enigmatic and Shaq, I never thought was, and, and Kobe was. Um, and I just, the more, I remember, all right, so when I was, um, when I, I used to write for Sports Illustrated and this was the late nineties and my roommate was a guy named, in New York City, was a guy named Russ Bankson and he was the editor of Slam Magazine when I was at SI. We went to college together. And I remember when Kobe was on the cover of Slam. He'd be on the cover every now and then. Slam at the time, you guys probably remember Slam. It it was the best out there. The best. And it was a merging of hip hop and style and culture and basketball. I used to, I used to look, I used to look and see if I'd be in like somebody around my area in Alabama would be in Slam. It it was the the mecca. The best. Was Shea Cotton from Alabama? Yeah, Shea Cotton. Heck yeah. Yeah, Yeah. heck yeah. Shea Cotton was a great player. Um, (laughs) And so, so like, um, I remember, like, to me, Slam was Iverson and Marbury and Garnett, right? It was kind of like, it was guys who came from pretty tough upbringings, and it was about Tad, like Iverson with his tattoos and the cornrows, and that was that was Slam, and it's what made it great. And I remember one time, Kobe was in Slam. I always remember this. And Rush showed me the new issue, and it was Kobe. And on the, he showed me the inside spread, and there was a picture of Kobe, and they accidentally forgot or failed to airbrush a big white zit on his head. And there was a big zit on Kobe Bryant's head in Slam Magazine, like a big fat white pimple ready to pop zit. And I always thought that really explained in a way, there's something about that that stuck with me. Like he was always trying to be something he wasn't. Like at the end, that's actually who he was. He was just a kid playing in the NBA who had the insecurity of a kid and the shelteredness of a kid and wasn't really good with women and didn't really know how to interact with people. And I just think the thing I really learned about him in a very sad way, I think he was raised kind of in a bubble. Um, he signed a shoe deal with Adidas at 17. He took Brandy to the prom, boys to men were at his press conference to go to the NBA. He shows up in the NBA. He's insecure and doesn't know how to talk to people. He was always trying to be, he was imitating Michael Jordan. He was imitating Iverson. At one point he was trying to be Will Smith. Another time he's trying to be all kind of tough when he's going through, he's getting attached during the Eagle Colorado stuff. I just think he was in a way, the sad example of someone who didn't have a normal childhood. Um, and then was always trying to convince people what he was. Yeah. And that was the thing that I really took away from Kobe Bryant. I didn't know that much about him. And I just think like at the end of the day, he was the guy with the zit. That's who he was. He was a kid with a zit. who was kind of insecure and awkward and blah, blah, blah. And he was always trying to cover it up. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it would, most of uh, our perceptions of Kobe are going to be always what was presented to us, you know, whether yeah. it's uh, an ESPN guy commenting about him or just seeing him in a game or, you know, the Eagle stuff and, and all that in this 
this uh, flawed individual that we didn't really know why or how or whatever. I mean, I guess you could kind of, everybody's perception of him was probably different. And that's what, you know, one of the main things I've really enjoyed about this so far is, is seeing, I guess, the, a, a better understanding uh, of, of who they were as much as we can, you right. know, right. Um, in, in some ways, like learning new things about like Kobe, like what really made him flawed and with guys like Shaq confirming, <laughs> I think what, uh, you know, same thing. Uh, what, you know, we, we had uh, uh, Ryan uh, or Rayon, Rayon Ali that, that wrote a book about NBA jam uh, interviewed Shaq for the NBA jam book that, that he uh, wrote and talked about how, how much he enjoyed this, this interview with him. What was, what was interviewing Shaq like this larger than life personality? He was great. He was cool. He was, um, I went down to Turner studios. He was eating dinner. There were two things that I stand out from the experience. Number one, at one point midway through the interview, his daughter FaceTimed and, um, he excused himself. And I, I was sitting right there though. She's like, uh, Hey daddy. He's like, Hey baby, what's going on? And she's like, do you remember, um, the mother of so-and-so who, you know, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, she died the other day. It's really sad. They're having a hard time with it. And he goes, um, all right, listen, I'm going to pay for the funeral. Make sure no one pays for anything except for me. I'm going to pay for the funeral. All right, daddy, you're the best. Talk to you. Bye. Back to the interview. And it really sort of um, exemplified a lot of what I heard about Shaq, just the decency and the goodness. And then the other thing, well, three things. Number two, he was holding a, uh, he was holding a, um, drink a can of soda and his hand is so ridiculously enormous <laughs> that like he made the soda can look like this pen like, you know, so big and then the third is at the end and remember this was all before Kobe had passed I said to him I was like there's one thing I want to ask you um you know you always gave yourself these nicknames but it was always with a wink big Aristotle Shaq Diesel it was always kind of a joke you know I was like it um but Shaq when Kobe called himself Black Mamba it seems like he literally thought of himself as a black mamba. Like he literally, it wasn't a joke. It was, and he goes, bro, now you know what I was dealing with. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to chew up all the stories here. Cause I got to tell you guys, everybody that's listening to this, you got to go get this book. We're going to drop Jeff's uh, website in the, uh, in the show notes here. We're going to be tweeting it out. Everybody to go pick it up, but maybe before we let you go, something, um, it, you know, I, I know this is that I, I went back and actually kind of read through your Twitter and stuff back in uh, the beginning of the year and, and when Kobe passed and, and everything, you know, books coming out eight months, you know, after that happened. Um, I guess, it, you know, the, you getting to, to speak with him and, and you're writing about him and, and uh, you know, you kind of said earlier, just, you know, trying to wrap your head around uh, what, what happened there at the end, I guess, what's something that, that maybe you took away from this process with, uh, interviewing him and writing about him and stuff that, um, maybe you're just going to kind of continue to think about and, and take with you. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, blow this one, but I will say Kobe would not talk for the book. I got Shaq. Uh-huh. I got Phil. And early on when I, uh, you know, obviously you try to get everyone. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I was told early on, I was like, Kobe's probably not going to talk. And I was like, really? And I, I sent him a book. I think I sent him a book, wrote letters, called different people. Mm-hmm. And um, I think the two main reasons were number one, he had his own book coming out, Mama Mentality. Yep. And number two, I write a lot about sort of the, uh, I mean, just being honest, I write a lot about Eagle, Colorado. And, you know, I made it clear I was writing about 96 to 04, which includes that time period. Yep. And it's not really a period he discusses or discussed much at all. For sure. Um, and I always say this is long winded. I always say like, Nobody ever owes it to you to write talk for your book ever. Mm-hmm. They're not making money off of it. They don't get final say. They don't get to read it before it comes out. The incentive is you want to be a part of the historical retelling of, of something that was big in your life, but it's not for everyone. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, the thing I would say, sincerely, I took away from this all. Like, it's interesting. I was very nervous about the reaction people would have to the book after Kobe died. Yeah. Because if you read it, it's not... I can't say it's Kobe friendly. It's not Kobe destroying, but it's not Kobe friendly. And I wondered how people would take it. And I've gotten almost no negative feedback whatsoever to my great shock and happiness. And I think the thing is people knew about Kobe's flaws. Like nobody thought Kobe was like 
you know, the Pope. And nobody thought Kobe was, and everyone knew about Eagle Colorado. And everyone knew he could be a pain in the ass. Like that was not a secret that Kobe Bryant could be a pain in the ass and wasn't the best teammate. But I've learned since he passed and living out here in Southern California, I'm not a native, I've been here for six years. The thing I've learned that's kind of fascinating, what people felt in Kobe and when he died, what they really felt, and I'm not, this is not hyperbole, I'm not bullshitting. I really felt this in a huge way. It was like, Kobe Bryant taught me how to work. Kobe Bryant showed me that if you bust your ass, you can accomplish anything. Kobe Bryant showed, he dreamed of being Michael Jordan and he basically became Michael Jordan. Like that is a thing that people, one fan after another, after another, after another. It wasn't, it wasn't Kobe Bryant won five NBA titles. It wasn't Kobe Bryant, blah, 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 his final game. It was Kobe Bryant worked his ass off and showed us that if you work your ass off, you can accomplish something. And I, I've been saying this over and over, like, I don't think Kobe Bryant was a better player than Michael Jordan. I don't think he was a better player than LeBron, to be honest with you. I think he's a top 10 all-time NBA player. But if your legacy is you worked your ass off and you inspired tons and tons of people to also yeah. work their ass off, that's an amazing freaking legacy. I'd rather have that legacy than Michael Jordan's, which is won six NBA titles, but kind of seems like a bitter jerk a little bit. Like <laughs> Kobe's legacy is worked his ass off, inspired people to work their asses off. 100%. That's as good as it gets. I mean, honestly, that's kind of the perfect answer for where Thomas and I come from because he's working with kids every day. I'm literally talking to thousands of kids every day. And when Kobe died, uh, I, I said this to Mark that it, because so much of our world, especially, um, you know, in our just day to day, if you're not around a ton of people is via social media and you literally saw the entire world like just exhale at the same time because I'm, I'm following kids and, and basketball people. And the, all they talked about all day, the Twitter feed is just filled with, you know, Kobe inspired me to X, Y, and Z. And none of these people had ever met him. Right. Yeah. Like it was, it, they have no actual connection to Kobe, but the Kobe, the connection that they had was what made him great. You know what's amazing? I would say, I was just thinking, I just want to say real quick, like, so his contemporaries, Iverson, Garnett, Duncan, let's just say those three. And obviously I, I want them all to live very long and fruitful lives, but like if any of those guys had died the same, the same way at the same time, the reaction would be nearly the same. Right. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same. There was something about Kobe that just was different level. Yep. If Jeff, I've, I've talked about this on the podcast before, and you talk about leaving a legacy and inspiring people. When I met him at ABCD, you know, that was 2000, 2001, 19, 20 years later. And I still like you, you, I've met plenty of famous people. I've been around plenty of whatever, but for him to talk about the mental and physical side of basketball and life and how it's more mental than physical at such a young age for him. And then I still use that today in my everyday life. And when I played and then when I teach my kids and when I talk to my friends, like, are you kidding me? Like that's Kobe. And that's amazing. Years ago. It's, it's absolutely insane that somebody like that can still inspire me. And I still remember that like it was yesterday. And yeah. so you're right. You're exactly right. And, and regardless of it, you know, interviewing him or not, when, when you read this book, everybody that's listening to this again, you've got to go get this book. You get to see this beautifully narrated human. I think that's that's the only way I could think of it as I was reading this going, I didn't know all of these things, but I'm getting told this this story. And, and for me, you know, I, my, my real, um, I guess, drive reading this was I wanted to learn more about Kobe. So I'm learning about all these other cool things and stuff, but I wanted to learn more about him and coming up in that time period and things. And, and I'm, I'm just, I'm excited to, to get through the, the rest of the book and finish it and just kind of get the real holistic picture of a lot of these things that I didn't know, but it's, it's, it's human. Like it's a human story that you're telling here and, and you've uh, you've presented it in such a way that, like you said, you're not, you're not putting them here. You're not putting them here. You're presenting it in, in a way that's colorful and, and real. And, uh, and that's what I've enjoyed so much about this so, you know the second half of the book it's all blank pages oh damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well i'll get through it real quick <laughs> yeah it's a quick read I, I'm, I'm literally sitting here fit, reading the book today trying to get through as much as possible and my wife kept coming down and she's like hey can you come outside i'm like no i'm i'm 
I'm working. <laughs> I'm preparing for this interview tonight. Exactly. Yeah, tough shit. Come, come outside. I need you to do this thing. So I don't want to be responsible for your divorce. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I'll make it. I think I'll make it, but Thanks, uh, uh, thank you again so much for coming on. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you this, so much. Uh, this book is, this book is great. And, and, uh, and, and I say this in all complete sincerity and honesty, when I'm done with this one, I'm going to pick another one. And I'm going to move on because I absolutely love the way that you tell these stories. And, uh, and so I'm just looking forward to the rest of this book and, and, uh, and the next one. And, and as a, as a kid who grew up with Bo Jackson as his sports idol, literally right over here is Bo Jackson hitting the home run for the White Sox when he came back in an eight by 10 that he signed. Wow. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped about this one. So. Hey, I just want to tell you one thing real quick. I'm doing research on Bo Jackson. I come across this clip today and it just made my freaking day because I'm, I'm a geek like this. And when you get deep into it, 1989, it was a small little paragraph in a newspaper. It said the other day, Bo Jackson hit the fourth longest home run in the history of the Metrodome during batting practice. Right. And then the last paragraph, it said he did it lefty. <laughs> He was not a left-handed hitter. He was a right-handed hitter, and he just was goofing around in batting practice and hit the fourth longest home run lefty. Bo Jackson, man, one of the greatest athletes of all time. If I mean, I'm just saying, maybe if you know, B B, I'm Alabama boy right here. I did book reports on him when I was in third and fourth and fifth grade. He was he's a legend where I'm from. He's Have you man. been to Besmer, Alabama? Oh yeah, I've been. It, it's he he spoke. I wasn't there. It was like a, a a rival high school. He spoke to one time, and to this day, I mean, he's still a god. Yeah. And it, you know what? He's, he's as uh, personable um, and, and kind of just human and natural as any celebrity that I've spent any time around. I've been to some tailgates and stuff. I used to go down to Auburn a lot mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of home games and stuff. And I always had my Bo Jackson Auburn jersey on. And well, I think there's something about the somewhere. mythology of him that's sure. really interesting. Like to me, I know this isn't about that. Like what I find fascinating so far is this idea like he didn't have a Shaq or Kobe kind of run. Like it did end quickly. And there's this yeah. whole, what would have happened? And in a way, maybe it's not a book if he goes on and he's Albert Bell in baseball or if he's yeah. Marcus Allen in football, you know, maybe like then the whole thing is this whole cloud of what would have happened. So I find that really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, the, the what if of, of Bo Jackson is one of the great sports questions that'll never be answered because some of the things that he did. Yeah. I mean, we, we've not seen again. <laughs> So yeah, um, YouTube is his friend. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you again, man. Uh, this was great. And I'm um, looking forward to uh, continuing to follow along with, with what's next for you and reading more and, and, uh, and, and just finishing this book, man. All right. Thank you both so much. All right, Thanks, everybody. Jeff. Be good. Take All care. right. Take care. Bye -bye. See you.